So we have started recording now. Um, and since we're talking uh, GDPR today, um, I have a few disclaimers to make. First of all, um, uh, whatever is said is in the presentation is our facts that uh, uh, I'm referencing certain uh, sources for, for. And also, if there is opinion, opinions are purely mine, not my organizations. Um, so also, uh, since the call is recorded, um, I want you to know that uh, we may place uh, the recording on uh, the YouTube channel of uh, the Women in Cybersecurity Middle East uh, group. Uh, so your participating with the voicing questions indicates that you give us your consent to, uh, to have those questions as part of the recording posted to the YouTube channel. Okay, so let's start. So how are we? Um, okay, muting, mute all. So, how are we uh, going to uh, go about this? First, we're going to give a, a quick overview of GDPR. Um, of course, GDPR, as the joke here says, it's a big deal. It's a big uh, uh, topic. It's a wide topic. It has a lot of um, considerations and it needs a lot of uh, uh, reading the regulation itself, reading all the articles, understanding it clearly and applying it to your uh, organization. Uh, but we'll just give a quick overview then. Uh, I'm also going to reference uh, data protection regulations in the Middle East. So it's not like data protection was not there. Um, several countries in the Middle East either had their laws already uh, published and uh, implemented, or uh, they are in the process of drafting new ones after uh, GDPR. Um, we're going to discuss uh, the main data subject rights under GDPR. Uh, data subject, by the way, means uh, the customer or the employee. It is the natural person from which we as organizations collect data. They are called data subjects. Um, then we'll uh, quickly highlight the main requirements of uh, the regulation. We'll also uh, talk about uh, synergies with other regulations particularly if we're in the banking sector. If we're in the banking sector, we're already a highly regulated industry. So we already um, have many standards and regulations to comply with, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel for GDPR. There are some synergies that uh, can be used to uh, jumpstart our compliance with the data protection regulations. Uh, and also we'll talk about the compliance journey, where to begin, now this part specifically is a sort of opinion. So this one is open to discussion. Uh, then we'll uh, move to Q&A. If Dr. Jalila joins, then uh, we will hear from her as well before the Q&A part. Okay, so now the, a quick overview. Um, as, as you may know, the GDPR, first of all, it stands for General uh, Data Protection Regulation. It was issued by the European Union. Um, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, it became uh, effective. The deadline for uh, complying with the regulation was uh, last year, 25 May 2018. Uh, the new regulation replaces the previous EU 1995 Privacy Directive. Uh, many of you may have heard about uh, the, you know, the privacy principles in that directive. It was um, similar to GDPR. However, GDPR added uh, a lot of uh, enforcements around uh, the privacy requirements. The GDPR has 11 main chapters and has 99 articles. Now, uh, uh, the exact text of GDPR, of course, I advise everyone, you must read it. Um, and uh, it is posted on uh, the official website of the EU, uh, as well as a reference, another source uh, that I'm sharing in the source section at the end of the presentation. It has it classified by chapter. You can search for a particular issue and it, uh, it, it takes you right away to that uh, article or the several articles that may discuss this issue. For example, if you want to know uh, what does a data protection officer do? What is his main responsibilities? Um, uh, who, who should normally fill this position. Uh, you can search, type it in the search, and it will bring you all the relevant articles. And I think this is a good way to always check uh, the regulation and uh, reference uh, all the necessary information. So why, why uh, did the EU issue a new regulation and, uh, to replace the current uh, or the previous 
uh, director. One of the main reasons, they cite many reasons in the, in the regulation itself. However, one of the main reasons listed in the introduction is that in order to ensure pro effective protection of personal data throughout the union, they had to, you notice, they use uh, the word strengthen several times. They, want, they had to strengthen the details of data subject rights and the obligations of those who process the data. Who are those who process the data? They are either what they call controllers or process. Controllers are, you know, the companies or the banks or the organizations that collect uh, the data from the data subject to uh, process it in order to provide certain services to the uh, data subject. However, the organization, being large or small, may decide to outsource uh, some of uh, its activities to a processor that may, uh, that may process its, uh, uh, the data of the data subject on its behalf, in which case this is the processor. And under GDPR, the processor also has uh, certain obligations. Uh, also, to strengthen the powers for monitoring and ensuring compliance and, the, and, and equivalently imposing strong sanctions for non-compliance. So uh, the mechanism, there had to be a mechanism of monitoring and a mechanism of uh, reporting complaints and taking actions on those complaints. So they created those structures and uh, for data protection authority in the different countries and they mandated uh, not only reporting of breaches, but uh, the regular data subjects can uh, file complaints and they look into complaints and uh, there are certain remedies that the data subject can uh, get if uh, uh, the claim is verified, the complaint is verified. So was the whole uh, data protection thing uh, new? Um, or we had uh, countries in the Middle East already working on their own uh, data protection regulations. Now, uh, I'm listing here some of uh, the countries in the Middle East uh, that are already working. Now, Asil is saying uh, the voice is not uh, very clear. Is anybody having an issue with sound as well? With the voice, can you hear me clearly now? Okay, I will resume. So uh, Egypt, for example, Egypt's data protection law has been already drafted and approved by the uh, ICT committee in parliament and it's pending voting from the General Assembly. So the draft law has been uh, put in place and discussed and it's also uh, undergoing other discussions from different industries uh, in parliament. Um, also Bahrain, Bahrain actually, uh, the issued the law already in July and it entered into force last August. Uh, they call it the DPL or the data protection law. It's applicable to private sector only, but it is already now uh, implemented and in effect, the DPL in Bahrain. Um, I, I took uh, uh, a notice of some of the common points between uh, the data, data protection regulations in Egypt and Bahrain and noted that uh, in both cases, there is a local data protection authority that will investigate breaches. Uh, there is also criminal penalties that exist for violations, not only um, uh, money penalties or uh, percentages of revenue as we see in GDPR, uh, there is also a required permission if you want to transfer data outside the country. Uh, this part is similar to the adequacy requirement in GDPR, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so that's for Egypt and Bahrain. In Lebanon, there is law number 81. This, re this is not uh, uh, particularly called uh, data protection regulation. However, it's a law that regulates electronic transactions and personal data. It was introduced last year in October. In Algeria, uh, there is uh, the protection of personal data law number uh, 18 for 1807 of June 2018. This is yet, in, uh, although issued, it's not yet in force. It, is, it will come into force with the establishment of uh, a data protection authority. In Jordan, there is no data protection law in place. Uh, however, they have a data protection bill that has been issued and is undergoing rounds of public consultation. Uh, for Tunisia, 
there is a protection law that exists to Tower actually, and uh, a DPA also exists there, an authority to investigate uh, complaints. Uh, however, a new updated data protection bill is also introduced, and it's also open to public discussion. Morocco has uh, a law for protecting processing of personal data, and it came into effect into, in uh, 2009. Now, for the GCC, there is no federal data protection law across, uh, that is unified across the countries of the GCC. Um, however, individual laws exist, like we said, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Oman, and Saudi Arabia, uh, the, there is no dedicated law. However, uh, the privacy rights are protected by a constitution. Um, there is also a draft uh, law being um, uh, currently developed in Oman. In the UAE, actually, and in the uh, last slide of the presentation where I put the references and the sources, I actually put a reference to uh, the full uh, UAE uh, law in the free zone, in uh, uh, the one that relates to the Abu Dhabi uh, Global Market Authority. Uh, um, it, it was issued in 2015 and amended in 2018. However, I, I, I recommend that you take a look at, uh, at this um, law because at the end of uh, the document, they put suggested uh, text for agreements when you do transfers, data transfer with third, uh, third countries, with other countries outside when you are going to transfer data outside the country. Uh, the, the wording, uh, you can check it out. Uh, it's very good and it will help if you need to, to, to draft similar uh, agreements. Uh, there is also another law for uh, the other free zone in, um, in UAE, which is uh, the DIFC, the Dubai International Financial Center. The authority passed a data protection law, uh, number one for 2007. However, it, it is currently being updated and they published a draft for a new law <clears throat> that is currently open for public consultation. As for Qatar, similar to the Bahrain, uh, they also issued their own data protection law in September 2016. Now, this was an overview of which countries uh, in the Middle East already have or uh, about to have data protection regulations or uh, laws of their own national ones. So why the big fuss around GDPR in particular? It's because of the global, if it's of its global outreach. So uh, where the laws we referenced in the previous slides were local laws. They are applicable within a certain country. However, the GDPR is not only applicable to the countries, how many are they, 28 countries of the European Union, but they also extend to cover the processing of personal data of European citizens by other controllers or organizations that may fall outside the Union. So, for example, if, uh, if we work at a bank and this bank uh, pro uh, provides banking services for European citizens, we are not in the European Union. However, because we have, we are processing the some European citizens, for example, we would be required to uh, comply with the GDPR requirements. Central banks in the UAE and in Egypt said, uh, uh, local banks are not required to comply with GDPR. However, if they do have branches that operate in countries of the Union, then those branches must be compliant. Um, so, of course, this uh, puts, uh, you know, uh, the pressure. GDPR uh, took the, you know, the, became very popular because of uh, this pressure. You have to check, similar to the FATCA regulations, the compliance uh, for the U.S. Um, you, the, you are not in the U.S., but you still have to uh, comply with those requirements. So, the regulation, how it is structured, because I think the easiest way to understand GDPR is uh, to know where to look for information when we need one and quickly. So the chapter one, it, it, we said it's 11 chapters, 99 clauses. Chapter one, the general provisions, they talk about the, um, uh, the scope, material scope, territorial scope. Uh, as we said, it applies to uh, companies or uh, controllers that are outside the EU if they are processing uh, data for uh, European citizens. Chapter 2 discusses the main principles of GDPR. Chapter 3 discusses in details the articles related to the rights 
of uh, data subjects. And we are going to cover this in detail. So chapter three, we're going to cover it here. Chapter four, the controller and processor. This discusses the obligations that the controller and the processor must do in order to protect uh, the, the data of the data subjects. Chapter five uh, discusses the transfers, the controls uh, around transfer of personal data to third countries. Uh, as we said, the adequacy principle. The adequacy means that uh, you can transfer uh, data to uh, third countries outside, you know, outside your jurisdiction, provided this country also has a certain level of uh, uh, compliance with GDPR that is approved by the EU. Currently, the EU has approved a list of, um, I can't recall the exact number of the death dated. It's, it's not many, it's like less than 20. Those are countries outside the European Union, like the US, Canada, uh, and other countries that they see as adequate or appropriate to transfer data to. However, important here to say that for national uh, data protection regulation, regulations in each country, uh, you may find the requirement to obtain specific permission from your local data protection authority, even if that country is, in, is on the adequacy list. Chapter six discusses the independent supervisory authorities and the role. Chapter seven uh, about cooperation consistency among the authorities. Chapter eight about the remedies, liabilities, and penalties uh, when you're in violation of the law of the regulation. Chapter nine discusses provisions relating to specific processing situations, like they discuss religious institutions, like uh, uh, other uh, situations where there would be exceptions uh, or uh, how to regulate their dealing under GDPR. Uh, chapter 10 uh, discusses the delegated acts and implemented acts. Uh, the European Union and the European Parliament would delegate to uh, the data protection authorities and it discusses the, uh, how is this controlled. Chapter 11, the final provisions. Now, the main, the main uh, data subject rights under GDPR. First, the right to be informed. So when you're collecting, in simple words, when you're collecting data from a data subject, if you're a company, if you're a bank, any type of organization, then this data subject, customer or employee, needs to know the purpose for which you're collecting the data, how you're going to use it, uh, how you're going to store it, uh, uh, that you are, if you are going to transfer it to another third party, all this needs to be declared in an easy, understandable uh, manner. Uh, there is also the right of access. Uh, a data subject may come uh, to your organization and say, I want to access uh, my data. I want to see what data uh, you are storing when processing on my behalf. So I, I want you to respond to me with a, with a list of all the data you're storing on me. Um, there is also the right of rectification. Rectification means to correct uh, the data, if it's outdated, for example, if the customer now accesses the data and sees that you are uh, processing outdated data for, for him or her, then he has the right that you must uh, fix it and update it in your uh, systems. Uh, there is the right of erasure. This is one of the challenging rights <laughs> to implement. The right of erasure, or uh, sometimes they call it the right to be forgotten. This is when a customer says, okay, Thank you very much. You are supposed to delete my data. I don't want your services. Please, please uh, delete my the data that you have uh, for me in your organization. Now, this this is uh, a bit of a challenge. Along with the other one, there is uh, also the right or to restrict processing. Let's explain it first. So, the right to restrict processing means, um, for example, this person. Uh, this data subject filed a complaint against your organization that it did not have legal grounds of processing his data, his or her data, in a certain way. So until the DPA gets back to him, which I think, uh, as I recall, should be within a month's time, until they get back to him or her, they may uh, request you as an organization to restrict processing. They are not requesting you to delete their data yet, uh, they are uh, uh, telling you, keep my data, but do not uh, process it. Do not do the services, uh, put them on hold. This is also another challenge. Now, why, why the right of erasure 
is a challenge because imagine you are processing uh, uh, bulks of uh, data for your customers. Uh, you need to make changes to your system such that you can flag a certain, uh, you know, customer, a certain data subject, and then uh, this flag, okay, it means that from that date onwards, you are going to stop processing data for him, which means this action has to somehow propagate to all your systems, um, has to somehow propagate to all your backups, to all your logs, because it, it, it has to be done in full, not partial. There is also the right of data portability. Uh, right of data portability, the, the, the customer or the data subject would have the right to request uh, the data in a, a readable format. And also may request to transfer this data to another controller. So you as an organization is a controller that uh, provides similar service. If he, uh, the customer does not decide to, uh, decides not to continue, um, having services from you and wants to move to another, say, comp uh, competitive bank or something, you have to help him and do and process this portability, transfer his data in um, a reasonable uh, timeline. Uh, it has to be done quickly and without delay. There is also the right to object. Uh, object means, okay, I gave you previous consent to uh, process my data. Now I object to this processing. Then there is also the final one is the right to manual processing. This is when, um, for example, uh, you use data and uh, use it for data analytics to derive uh, insights into this data so that you can uh, tailor specific uh, services and uh, marketing activities towards uh, segments of customers. So you need to profile them. Now the GDPR gives the data subject the right to be exempted, to request to be exempted from this profiling. Uh, this is, of course, another uh, challenge with respect to implementation. Now, uh, some highlights of the regulation, because as we said, the one session is not enough to cover everything uh, in GDPR. Uh, fines that are exercised uh, for violation of uh, GDPR can go up to 4% of the annual global turnover of the organization. Now, do all violations, um, do uh, data protection authorities impose that much uh, fines for all violations? No, several, several considerations are uh, taken into account before uh, a GPA decides on the actual uh, fine to be implemented. And one key factor in deciding this amount is uh, how much the controller or the organization was cooperative uh, uh, when they identified, for, when they, for example, witnessed a breach. Uh, did they report it immediately? Did they uh, take the necessary measures to uh, mitigate uh, uh, the risk that led to this incident? Uh, all of this, um, did their D DPO, their data protection officer, did he uh, or she cooperate uh, promptly with the DPA? So are all factors that affect the amount of fee in case of a violation or a breach. Um, the regulation also requires breach notification within 72 hours of being aware of the breach to the relevant uh, data protection authority. Now, 72 hours may sound very challenging, of course. Um, however, it says of being aware of the breach. Aware of the breach, um, not... Uh, not all organizations get immediately aware that they are undergoing breaches. However, if the breach is publicized, like uh, for example, uh, we are not going to mention names, but there was a, a popular payment processor, uh, payment uh, brand company that had a breach that was, uh, you know, leakage of information on the internet whereby uh, people, uh, normal data subjects uh, noticed and uh, knew about it, so they started reporting it. So that was like the second day the incident took place. So this means, indicates that they cannot be not aware. So they had to, of course, uh, immediately report uh, the breach to the uh, relevant uh, DPA at the time. There is also a requirement for privacy by design. Privacy by design means that you include data protection uh, principles from the beginning of uh, designing or implementing a system rather than later on. 
this will facilitate the easier implementation and ensure you only have uh, you do you know your data minimization you only have the necessary data to process a service and not over um, uh, data is overfed into the system now there is also a requirement to create data inventories this is an article 30 these inventories are a register of all the data processes uh, in the organization so a data inventory what does it include it includes an overview of the processing activity uh, it includes the data categories uh, what are uh, the types of data subjects who would normally own such data what is the purpose that we are collecting this data for example uh, with whom are we sharing the data to process this activity um, what are the security controls we're implementing over the process and what are what is our legal grounds for doing so now here um, for banks again if, if we have any audience from banking uh, this this will not mean that you start all over from nowhere um, banks already for example uh, have many uh, applications and systems that talk to each other and uh, most banks already have documentation for uh, the APIs and the data exchanged among uh, those systems internally so they would have some type of repository you will just need to amend uh, this repository to show and reflect uh, additional items you, you will not reinvent the wheel and also it is recommended that you maintain an excel template for uh, the different uh, elements that you need to capture uh, around the data and also a data map a data flow chart that says the data this you know these fields so and so they go into this application then they go out and are fed into another application so this is a data map or a data flow chart uh, and when we're saying processing activity don't think about it like everything you do for the like one process one big process you do for the customer but you have to uh, break them down down into uh, in, uh, main important processes like for example if we are doing um, accounting, so account opening is one process if we're doing um, uh, card uh, management uh, for card management applications that's another process so you have to break them down into processes and take it uh, granular and this will help a lot to know where your data resides and help you uh, of course implement the required protection now there is also uh, a requirement to conduct data protection impact assessment you know most of us are familiar with business continuity management so you do a bit in business continuity you do a business impact uh, analysis this is a data protection impact analysis or impact assessment you will take every processing activity not all of them however the regulation only requires that you do a dpia for uh, the the processes the data processing activities that are likely to lead to a high risk to the freedom of data subjects this is how the regulation raises it it says high risk that is highly likely to lead to a high risk to the freedom of data subject now i'm including situations that i got uh, some from the exam i had uh, recently undergone the exam for a uh, certified data protection officer and some also from uh, the example guidance uh, the eu has placed on its website so uh, a situation where a hospital is processing genetic data for patients of course this is a high risk activity so this you must do a data protection impact assessment for uh, a company monitoring employees email and internet activity if you're a large bank if you're a large organization you would be doing so so you will be required to undergo uh, or implement a data protection impact assessment a magazine processing an email list of subscribed customers no this is not a high risk uh, activity and probably you had consent from your customers to uh, send them emails for uh, once you subscribe so this is not a high risk activity you don't need to conduct a special if these uh, processes a bank authenticating its customer access to their accounts using fingerprint this is a high risk activity now um, i forgot to mention you'll find it in the regulation in the specific uh, situations that uh, there, are, there is a category of data called uh, the highly sensitive personal uh, information. Highly sensitive means data that is genetic data, biometric data like the fingerprint, uh, ethnic data, religious data, uh, data about political opinion, 
about memberships in political organizations. All these data is not allowed to be processed or stored in the regulation, by the regulation. So except under certain conditions. So for example, if the bank is using a mobile app and you're authenticating by fingerprint, this is biometric. However, uh, as a bank or as an organization using similar facility, you, you can uh, you, uh, process such data under GDPR because it is mandatory to the uh, execution of the service. If the customer consents and wants to have the convenience of uh, having a mobile app and consents to this, then it is not a problem. Similarly, for hospitals, for hospitals, they need to process genetic data to provide cert to do certain research to cure patients, and the patients give the consent. Then this is also allowed. Uh, last example: a physician storing personal data of his patients in his clinic. Again, similar to the magazine uh, uh, case uh, or situation. This is not a high risk activity, and he has probably already consent from his patients to process their records. Um, another uh, highlight in the regulation is the uh, appointment, mandatory appointment for a data protection officer. This is mentioned in Article uh, starting 36, 37. Um, however, not for all situations. Again, it's mandatory only where it states for public organizations where or where processing involves reg regular systematic monitoring of data subjects at a large scale. In uh, the course, I for DTO, they, they said the normal practice is 100 plus employees or more. If you're an organization that has 100 plus employees, large scale activities, then you need to appoint a DPO. So what does the data protection officer do? What are their responsibilities? And by the way, the, the regulation empowers uh, this position a lot. Uh, it requires uh, its independence in reporting. It requires um, that uh, you may not, uh, if there is a conflict in um, that will prevent him or a constraint in preventing him from doing his duties, you cannot impose such a constraint on him, very independent. Um, and to the extent that you may not fire him, simply for doing his job. So this is a very empowered uh, position. Uh, the main responsibilities are to provide awareness to uh, all stakeholders uh, in the organization, the, uh, uh, the organization meaning controller, as well as the processor, if there is outside uh, outsourced processors, uh, and employees, what are their obligations under GDPR and provide them with the necessary training. Another duty is to monitor uh, the compliance with the regulation and with the internal data protection policies. Uh, there's also the requirement to provide, uh, to provide advice uh, regarding the DPIA and monitor its performance. This is in Article 35. So the, the DPO may not be the one to perform the DPIA. Actually, it's better that it's not the, he's not the one. Uh, it's better that, for example, um, uh, the risk team, for example, in an organization, they can do the DPIA, they can do the data protection impact assessment, and it gets reviewed and ensured that it is done by the DPO. However, uh, to ensure his independence, it's better that he does not do it himself or herself. Um, the fourth uh, item is to cooperate with the supervisory authority. One of the main duties of uh, the DPO is to cooperate with data protection authority whenever they um, uh, ask for information about the organization that relates to data protection, whenever there is a breach and uh, uh, he cooperates with them to provide them information about the breach, about its impact, about uh, the necessary uh, mitigation measures that the organization uh, undertook to mitigate this breach and to consult with them uh, as appropriate with any other matter. Now, for the banking sector, I said, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We already um, have other standards that we have implemented, and there, is the, there are some areas where their synergy can be achieved. So for example, uh, scope. GDPR protects personal data. PCI DSS, which is the payment card industry data security standards, with, standard which most banks are required to comply with, it protects cardholder data, which is also personal data. So if you're familiar with the standard and all its requirements, you, you, you have this subset of uh, scope that you are dealing with, which is cardholder data. And now you will expand it to include uh, uh, other personal data outside the cardholder um, 
the scope only. Uh, also, when, when you think about it, PCI DSS requires that you have an incident response policy and certain reporting procedures when breaches take place. A PCI DSS breach is a GDPR breach. So if you have an incident that um, relates to the leakage or unauthorized the disclosure of uh, your card uh, information, this is also uh, classified as a breach under GDPR. So regarding your process, your existing process, instead of only reporting to say MasterCard and Visa and all the, and the local authorities, you also have to uh, uh, report to your uh, local data protection authority. So what I'm trying to say is you can build on the current processes and policies that you already have and extend them where necessary to uh, fit uh, the requirements of GDPR. Uh, also, if you're not compliant with PCI, this may increase your GDPR fine if there is a data breach. Remember when, when we said here that uh, GPA before imposing fines in, case, in, in cases of breach uh, takes into consideration several uh, points. One of them is organizing is uh, following and implementing the required laws and regulations and standards. So if you're not in compliance with PCI and you ex as a bank and you experience a large uh, breach of uh, cardholder data, then this will be implemented, uh, interpreted as lack of due diligence and the fine goes up. Uh, both standards require, for example, encryption and pseudonymization. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this word properly, of personal data. You have to either encrypt the personal data or uh, 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 transform it into a, a way such that it cannot uh, relate back to its uh, data subject. So this, again, is something where you can build on. Logging and auditing is required in both. Maintaining a security policy and, and conducting risk assessments is also required by both. So for banks, I think we are lucky. Other industries uh, may have uh, additional challenges when complying with GDPR. Uh, for example, one industry that jumps to my mind is uh, the tourism industry, because um, unless they are large hotels, uh, hotel chains or something, they did not uh, have uh, previous regulations to uh, the, to guide them in this regard, so uh, they would have a lot of challenges uh, implementing these uh, requirements of the standard of the regulation. Now, uh, to wrap up, if we want to uh, start complying with uh, a local, let's not. I'm not again here uh, talking GDPR only. Every country will eventually or already has its own data protection regulation, so. And this is the primary thing that you need to uh, comply with. Uh, of course, you comply with GDPR where you are required to comply with GDPR. Uh, but uh, the compliance journey is the same, almost the same. And this is here an opinion section which we can discuss. I think uh, first that you need to obtain the senior management support and ensure their, uh, the awareness of uh, the key stakeholders in your organization. Uh, you need to, some, some companies advise that you first, first of all, do uh, a readiness assessment. I don't, if you have not implemented any of the, of the main requirements of GDPR, I don't recommend that you do a readiness assessment first because that would simply result in a report where it says, this is not present, this is not present, this is not present. There are uh, key things that you can do and then you can, uh, as after you implement them, do the readiness assessment. It will uh, really then be very useful to determine where exactly you're not following. And not just generic uh, checklist that says not, uh, not available, not available, not in place. Um, so after obtaining a senior management support that you have a data protection regulation to, to comply with, and you establish clear governance uh, rules and responsibilities. Now, if you're a large organization, there need to be a data protection officer. And uh, other large organizations also implement uh, a certain governance structure called data protection or privacy council. Such a council uh, can consist of uh, the compliance team, a legal, um, information security, uh, and someone from IT because they would, an HR, because IT would eventually implement, uh, you know, the, the technology part that relates to encryption, that relates to uh, how to implement the right to be forgotten, etc. 
So a large organization, a really a data council, uh, a data protection council is uh, recommended. I think Facebook has one and many other uh, organizations have this uh, privacy council. Legal is very important also to be a member of such council if you are an organization that uh, works across multiple jurisdictions. Um, and you also prepare your inventory of data processing. Uh, before bringing in consultants, you have to have your inventory of data. If, without this inventory, you would not be really uh, knowing uh, how much data you, you, you store, you process, where are they stored in the different systems, which systems use which portions of data, uh, are we uh, legally okay to request that much data, uh, do we have the right consent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and conduct the data protection impact assessments for, again, the high-risk activities, uh, and put in place effective procedures for consent and other data subject rights. Effective procedures. Effective procedures means that you, you, it's not just an item on your checklist. It means that uh, you want to uh, uh, do um, uh, the procedure of the process of uh, getting consent, for example, from a large uh, number of customers. How can this be efficiently done? Because you also don't want to burden your internal operations. Uh, so this needs to be discussed uh, among the members of the council. Um, and use proper technology to effectively, of course, implement the data subject rights. Uh, review the privacy and policy, uh, the privacy policy and controls, uh, because many organizations would have already had uh, a privacy policy uh, for example, uh, in our bank, we already had a privacy policy. Many, many, many large organizations already had a privacy policy prior, prior to the release of GDPR. So this may need to be updated to reflect uh, additional requirements. And also embed GDPR compliance in any business process. When you're doing something, a new service, when you're having to deal with a third party, you need to discuss what data is going to be stored, what data is going to be exchanged, do we have the right agreements in place, are we outsourcing, one point here also, uh, are we outsourcing part of this service to a processor, did we uh, uh, communicate in writing in the agreement the obligations of the processor uh, properly, so all, the, all these steps uh, can be done, then you do uh, the readiness assessment and you'll be in a much uh, better position to know what exactly you're missing. So uh, that's it. Um, here, this is the, large, uh, the last slide that talks about um, uh, the EU. The European Commission actually prepared this infograph uh, after the one year of GDPR in effect. It shows um, how many, for example, number of queries and complaints here at the right uh, lower corner, at the left uh, corner of the screen, you see 144,000 uh, uh, complaints to the different data protection authorities. You will see also number of data breach notifications, 89,000. So imagine without GDPR, so people complain from GDPR and the burden it has, but imagine without, without it, we would not, we may have not known about the 89,000 uh, breach notifications that took place throughout the last year. So now, let's see if, uh, do we have uh, Dr. Jalila on the line? She may not have been able to join. So uh, now we can open the floor uh, for questions. I will uh, unmute now and we can have uh, a general uh, discussion. Just a second. Yes, so uh, um, unmute yourself. So let's let's put back um, mute individually and then if you have a question, unmute and uh, uh. hello. So now can you hear me or no? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Abir. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first, thank you very much for your time and for sharing this knowledge to us. Really appreciated. My question is, uh, how, 
how do airlines comply with the GDPR, for example, or let's say Emirates or Etihad Airlines here in the UAE, who are for sure having customers who are EU nationals? Uh, I'm not sure either. Uh, they must have, uh, you know, they must first determine how much, how many, of course, uh, EU passengers and what amount of data uh, is being processed on their behalf. Does it have uh, uh, PII data? Um, so, you know, they must have their data inventory first to see the amount of PII data uh, that they collect and uh, they must have uh, a data protection uh, policy in place and uh, put the necessary controls if they do uh, process uh, personally identifiable information for their customers. So personally identifiable information is not only the name, uh, they, if they have birth dates, if they have uh, addresses, if they have uh, those phone numbers, if they do not store all these personally identifiable information, they don't need to, uh, uh, to go into this process of compliance. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, <laughs> so this is, a, you know, it really depends on the uh, type of data they are processing, uh, mainly personally identifiable PII information or not. Okay. Uh, okay, if I may ask another question, <laughs> if others are not ready for their questions. You have one example of, um, uh, storing storing data when you are identifying whether it is high risk or not. Uh, you mentioned about a physician storing personal data of his patients in his clinic. Uh, it may not be a high risk because you said the, the doctor or the physician could have sought, could have sought the per, uh, per permission of his patients. Mm -hmm. Who would identify that and who would know if the doctor has sought permission from his patients? Like, um, you, yeah. how do you cl classify this? I'm just looking at it in the, in the way it's a situational uh, cases yeah. where you said you will identify if it's a high risk or not. Yeah. So uh, the, the physician will, have, uh, will not have large uh, uh, number of records of patients. Uh, so it's not in the thousands like controllers. Uh, however, how would data protection authorities know if a certain entity is required to comply or not? First, how does the complaint process work? Now, if an EU citizen files a complaint, then the data protection authority will start investigating, okay? That I didn't give a consent to this physician, all right? So this way, the data protection authority would know about, but if he's a, a, a physician in one country, even outside the EU, and he's processing data, and he had by, by, uh, by coincidence, a European citizen who came to his uh, clinic, and you know, he registered in order for him, for the physician, you know, to provide services, uh, you must register and complete a form. So if he completed the form, this may indicate implied consent. Um, it is not expected, you know, from regular doctors to do all this uh, uh, DP, uh, data protection impact assessment. It's not expected. The data protection impact assessment is only expected, uh, as they uh, specifically mentioned, the regulation from uh, controllers who process large, systematically large, uh, uh, and regularly uh, amounts of data for data subjects. So if he's not large, you know, it's not, you know, the few patients that come to his uh, clinic. Uh, this is one of the situations actually that is classified in the uh, guidance uh, provided by the EU that it does not require a, a data protection impact assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Abir. Yeah. So Dr. Jalila is not here. I hoped uh, that she would be able to make it because uh, we would have, uh, um, you know, had valuable input from her regarding how privacy relates to cyber psychology. Uh, but maybe then in another time we can schedule a session with her actually. All right. So um, if we don't have further questions, then uh, thank you very much. And we'll wrap up the session. And uh, um, we'll have the recording. When we have the recording ready, I will share it on the group. 
and uh, I send it also to Satna to post. Thank you very much and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Abir. Thank you. Thank you.